Well, welcome everybody to the final part of this study. The study that, we are, that we've been doing over the last couple of weeks, which is entitled, It's All About Jesus. Today is part number six. It's the final part today. So if you've missed any of the previous sessions, I strongly encourage you to go back and, and um, re-watch re them because it really lays a beautiful foundation to the conclusion of today's study. And it's really just been a, a beautiful study. I've really loved getting to, to understand Jesus in a much deeper level. And particularly as we come to the end of this year, and I'm sure many of you are planning your, your Christmas celebrations and your family celebrations, I think that having this as an understanding of who Jesus is, is really gonna help you appreciate the season in such a greater way. So I'm so glad to see you are all here and those who are gonna be watching the recording. It's lovely to have everyone here. Okay, well let's first start with our anchor scripture. We've got an anchor scripture for this year, which has basically come to an end, but let's say this anchor scripture together for maybe possibly the last time for, the, for this year. And the anchor scripture is Isaiah chapter 40, verse eight. And it says, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of God stands or remains. The word of God remains, the word of God stands. And that has really been, I think, a perfectly apt anchor scripture for this year. I can really say that for me personally, it's been an apt scripture because it, no matter what a person encounters, no matter what a person faces, when it says something in the word of God, and God, say, God gives, gives us a promise or a command or instruction in God's word, we know that that stands and that trumps everything that we are facing. Let us pray as we go into this final session. Father God, we come to you in the precious name and the most powerful name of Jesus. We thank you so much, Lord, for the study that we've been able to have the privilege of studying Jesus and getting to know Jesus on a deeper level. Lord, as we go into this final session today, as I always pray, I ask you, Holy Spirit, to anoint my lips and that every word that I speak will be exactly as you intend for it to be. I pray that the study will be a beautiful conclusion, a powerful revelation, and that everyone who listens to this will have no choice but to walk away changed. And I pray for your blessing upon your word in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Are you fine where you're sitting? You don't mind the angle that I'm looking at you at. If you don't mind. If you don't mind, I don't mind. I do. It makes a noise. I'm so sorry. Sorry. Okay, ladies, let's get started. So the study, it's all about Jesus. And the very first question I asked you in session number one is, who is Jesus to you? Who is Jesus to you? If somebody asks you to explain, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? I really hope and pray by now that we all have a grander understanding of who Jesus is. As we have spe specifically studied this portion of scripture in Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 to 11. No, that's the portion of scripture that we've really been looking at in the previous five sessions. And um, it's really been great. So I want to read this portion of scripture to you. Remember, this might be the first time you are ever watching a study with us, with the WOW group, Women of Word. We are Women of Word, so we read a lot of scripture, okay? So stick with me. And if you miss anything, you just go back and watch the recording. So the, this portion of scripture in Philippians chapter 2 says this, talking about Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took it upon himself the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of man. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven, earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. This is the portion of scripture that we have been looking at. And what a beautiful revelation it has been. In summary, I'm giving you a very short summary here. What we have learned in these previous sessions is that Jesus is part of the Godhead. 
The Godhead is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Jesus is part of that. He is God the Son. Jesus is God. Right in the first session, I explained it to you like this. I said, this is how what we believe in the triune fashion, or otherwise, as you would be familiar with, the Trinity. There is one what? There is one God. There is three who's. There's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So Jesus pre-existed with God and the Holy Spirit before the foundation of the earth. We have confirmed this. The scripture in John chapter 17, verse 5, Jesus speaking to the Father, and he says to the Father, Restore unto me the glory that I had with you before the world existed. And we studied that in depth. So we've seen and it's confirmed through the scripture, which we choose to believe the entire word of God, right? We do. We've confirmed in scripture that Jesus pre-existed with God before time. So Jesus was in heaven, in glory, in majesty, in perfection, in, as in our understanding of the word utopia. There was absolute, there was no evil, no sin, just absolute perfection in this beautiful place called heaven. And then they came to decide to create man. And then the plan was for man's redemption, as we've explained, that Jesus had to relinquish heaven. He had to let go of heaven. Willingly, he did this. He let go of his position in heaven and he grasped onto the exact form of man. He was exactly like man in every shape and form. He grasped onto that. And when he grasped onto the exact form of man, he did it out of humility and to obedience to the Father. That word humility, remember, was the word showing that he went to the lowest level possible. Lowest, he stooped to the lowest level to accomplish the mission. And the mission was to reunite us with the Father. And at the cross, there was that great exchange. Remember that great word schema in the word fashion? He was found in fashion. There was a great exchange that took place at the cross. And that exchange that Jesus did with us was he took on all our yuckiness and all our sin and all our evil and all our unrighteousness. And in exchange, he gave us his beauty and his righteousness and the right standing with God, being able to communicate with the Lord. He gave us this beautiful exchange, healing and provision, and the list goes on and on, as we have studied in previous sessions. And because Jesus did this, God the Father then gave Jesus a name that would be above every single name. So no matter what name you are facing, no matter what thing you are looking at, if it has a name, that thing is subject to the name of Jesus. Jesus' name will always override it. It will always trump everything else that has a name. That's what God gave Jesus, a name that is above every single name. And then we saw in the last session that then at that day, which, we've, which we studied, was the day of judgment. You can go back and re, go look at that session. That was session five. That day, as we read in Romans 14, 10 to 11, the day of judgment, at that day, every knee will bow. Every knee. Every knee in heaven, every knee on earth, and every knee under the earth. Every created being will bow to Jesus. Whether they want to or whether they don't want to, they will. So any person on earth up until now or has lived before now or in the future that refuses to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord, there will come a day that they will still have to bow their knee. They will have to bow their knee and they will confess. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Isn't that miraculous? Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that powerful? And that day is coming. And that day is coming. And we are all going to be the ones that are doing it willingly, not because we have to, right? Because we've chosen to accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior now, while we are on earth and while we can. So now in this final session, and as a matter of fact, the study could, co st could still go on for probably another two, three sessions, but for the sake of the time of the year, I'm condensing it. In the final session, we're going to be looking at two further parts. The one part we're looking at is the character of Jesus. And I'm really going to be doing an extreme summarized version. 
I wish I had more time, but we're going to be looking at the character of Jesus. I strongly, once again, encourage you during the holiday season, this might be something great for you to do. Take each one of the characteristics of Jesus and go do a personal study on it for yourself. Trust me, it will be the most exceptional experience and study that you've done. So we're going to look at the summarized version of the character of Jesus. And secondly, we're going to be looking at what is Jesus's position now? And what is the role of Jesus now? Those are the two things we're going to be looking at. So let's first look at the character of Jesus. I firstly want us to note, according to Romans chapter 8 verse 29, there's a, this scripture in Romans chapter 8 says this. I'm not going to read the whole scripture. Let me just read it for you. From, I'm reading from the Amplified Version, just from the one part. He also destined from the beginning for ordaining them to be molded into the image of his son and share inwardly his likeness. His likeness. You know that one of, I would say, God's missions through Jesus for us is that we will start looking more and more like Jesus we'd start behaving more and more like Jesus. The scripture talks about that we'll be molded into the likeness of Christ in Romans 8. Now remember in Philippians 2 verse 5, we've seen this in the previous studies, but I'm going to read it for you now as well. In Philippians chapter 2 verse 5, let me just grab there quickly, it says, let this same attitude, in other words, the attitude that Jesus had, let the same attitude and purpose and humble mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. So what it's saying here is that the characteristics of Jesus that we are now going to quickly look at, what the word is saying, let this be in you. Let the likeness of Christ be in you. Now I ask you the question, how are you doing in that department? How, how are you doing with looking like Jesus? It's good to actually stop and what I call to do a transformation progress report. <laughs> to look at your life and say, how am I progressing? Do I look more like Jesus today than I did a year ago? Do I look more like Jesus today than I did 10 years ago? How, how are you doing in that transformation progress report? Because if you think, now if you think about the character of Jesus, what characteristics really jump out for you? What like pops out for you? If someone says Jesus, what pops out for you at that point? Now remember, whatever you're thinking about and whatever we're about to go in our study, all of these characteristics, can everyone say all? Say all. All of the characteristics of Jesus are already in you. Hmm. It may not feel that way sometimes. <laughs> this last week I had a couple of um, non-Jesus moments. <laughs> Has anyone ever had a non-Jesus moment? And, it's, and you're not a, uh, thank you Pauline. A non-Jesus moment when I realized this is not the character of Jesus right now that I am showing. But we got to remember that all of the characteristics are within us because God the Holy Spirit is within us. If you are born again, as soon as you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit comes and dwells within you. And the fruit of the Holy Spirit, you know there's nine of them, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control, and gentleness. The nine fruits of the Spirit are automatically in you. Automatically. You already have the deposit of the character of Jesus in you. It's not something that you have to say, oh, I wish I could be more patient. You already have patience in you. You just have to start practicing patience. Praso. In a study we did, Living Transformed, we did a really great explanation on that, is that we, because even though we have the Holy Spirit in us and all the characteristics of Jesus in us, you still got to practice it, right? I'm not going to be looking at that now, but be, be just reaffirmed for yourself knowing that all the characteristics of Jesus are in you. How cool is that, Leanne? How great is that for you to know that you have already got it? Jesus has already helped you. He said, I'm putting my character 
right there within you. In John 15, 26, Jesus is speaking to the disciples and says, don't worry, guys, I am leaving you a helper. And my, this helper is going to be your advocate. He's going to be your counselor. He's going to be your teacher. He's going to be your mediator. This counselor, the Holy Spirit, he is going to help you to be more like me. John 15, 26, you can go read. I gave you the, summer, the, paraphrase, the paraphrased version of that right now. So Jesus did it. He says, yeah, you have my spirit. Now you can start being transformed into the likeness of who I am. So what stands out for you when it comes to the character of Jesus? I just want us to look at one or a few of them, and then we're going to be focusing heavily on point two today. But let's have a look at some of the characteristics. One thing that is very clear that just jumps out at me is that Jesus loved very easily. And he loves very easily. Hey, do you notice that when you read the gospel and you see how he loved people, it didn't matter who the people were. They could have been the most stinkiest, uh, disease-infested person with leprosy and pieces of their body falling off to the most evil person with the most terrible intentions in their heart or to the most holy person. It didn't matter who it was. Jesus loved very easily. It's something that really stands out for me. Now remember, his character is in us. Mm, mm. So when we did that grand study in 1 Corinthians 13, when was that, about two years ago, we did the study, the love study, and we really went into depth. That whole uh, portion of scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is talking about Jesus because he is love. God is love. So now that characteristic is in us is in us. But Jesus loved very, very easily. And because his character is in us, this statement is made in 1 John chapter 4. Let me read that for you. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 7 to 8. Let's get it. Also amplified version. It says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and he who loves his fellow man is begotten and born of God and is coming to know and understand God, to perceive and recognize and get a better and clearer knowledge of him. Verse 8. He who does not love has not become acquainted with God, does not and never did know, for God is love. So what the scripture is saying, if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord, and you've got the Holy Spirit living inside of you, loving people should start becoming easier. Hmm. That's what it's basically saying. Saying if you're born of God, you should love. Because it's part of who he is. It's part of the characteristic of Jesus. So Jesus really loved easily. He loved people very easily. Go and study that further for yourself. The second thing that pops out for me about Jesus, Jesus forgives freely. Oh, he makes forgiveness look so easy. <laughs> All of us in our day-to-day -day life, and we're like, oh my goodness, that person is so difficult to forgive. Jesus forgave so easily. It was just something so easy for him. Romans 10, 19, Romans 10, 13, that scripture says, call upon the name of Jesus and you will be saved. And we studied that in two sessions ago, referring to that word saved means be made whole, be forgiven, be redeemed, be rescued. It's just such a beautiful word that, but just call on Jesus and you will be saved. Now, it doesn't matter how evil people were, when as soon as they asked Jesus for forgiveness, bam, he would just forgive them. He wouldn't say, well, let me think about that one. You know, what you've done is rather bad. You know, if you think about what you've done, I mean, the guy on the cross that was on the other side of Jesus, those guys were bad guys. Jesus didn't, okay, yes, he was on the cross, he had gone through much, but it's not like he had went and gave him the 10th degree on what he had done. You know, he didn't like say, well, you know, you were actually really evil, and I don't know if I can really forgive you for this, and do you not know what you did really hurt a lot of people? I mean, the guy's just like, Jesus, forgive me, and Jesus like, Today you will be with me in heaven. <laughs> Bam, he just forgives. Just straight away forgives. There wasn't like this long delayed process of, I need to work through it. Did Jesus ever do that? <laughs> I hear what you're saying and I appreciate you asking me to forgive you, but I need time. I need time to get over this because what you've done is really hurtful. Just give me time. Come, let's talk again in a month. I need time to work through this. Jesus didn't do that. Someone said, Jesus, he's like, bam, I'm here, I forgive you. 
They called on the name of Jesus, Jeepers. They just, Jesus just forgave instantly. There was no condition, there was no, but what about this, what about that, what about this, what about that? Jesus forgave so easily. He made forgiveness look so easily. That's really something that popped out for me with Jesus. Another thing, that, another characteristic that is very clear about Jesus, he exuded compassion. Oh, Jesus just was so full of compassion. And that compassion within him is what moved him to help people. Maybe he was moved for compassion for the hungry crowd of people, and then he performed the miracle where everyone was able to eat. He was moved by compassion for the lady whose son had just died, and he then healed the son, or he raised the child from the dead. On so many occasions, you read in the scriptures where it says, and Jesus was moved by compassion. Compassion is what moved his heart to perform the miracle, to lend the hand, to save and to deliver. It's really something that kind of was driving force behind Jesus was his compassion. So what about us? Are we off the hook on that one? Well, no, because in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, it goes and says this. <laughs> And become useful and helpful and kind to one another. Be tender-hearted, be compassionate, understanding, loving-hearted, forgiving one another readily and freely as God in Christ forgave you. Now talking about the compassion here, the scripture is saying be compassionate. Just as Jesus was, show the same compassion. Let compassion be the, the driving force behind your living, behind your actions, behind your motives. That really stood out for me. Another characteristic that just pops out is Jesus' humility. We spoke quite at length about this two sessions ago. Jesus' humility. You know, he gave up his rights in order that we can be saved. He said, yes, I know that I'm king of kings and I'm lord of lords and I'm the son of God and I'm actually supposed to be positioned in heaven right now enjoying glory and honor and all of that, but I'm going to give that up. I'm going to humble myself to the point of nothing so that you can be saved. Beautiful. Such extreme humility. Hmm. I wonder how that applies to us. Think about that for yourself. How often do you have to give up your own rights for the sake of someone else? that you have to lower yourself and let someone else get the glory for something that you've put all the hard work in. Mm, mm, mm. Mm, mm. Okay. You go do your own study on that one. And then there's another characteristic that just really pops out about for me with Jesus. You know, Jesus had a no-nonsense attitude towards truth. No-nonsense attitude. Absolute no-nonsense attitude when it came to truth. He said very clearly in, in his word, and I'm going to give you the scriptures and you can go check them out. In John 14, verse 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the light. I am, Jesus says. He says, so he was very clear about that. He, was, he, he had an absolute no-nonsense attitude when it came towards truth. He said in Matthew 6, verse 14 to 15, forgive others so my father can forgive you. Very clear about it. He, there was none of this mincing the words and beating around the bush and saying, oh, you know, I, because of my compassion, I understand what you've been through and it's really, really hard. Jesus is like, forgive. He's got a no-nonsense attitude towards that. He had, an, had a no-nonsense attitude. You can read in John 2.15 when the people in the temple started selling merchandise in the temple in God's house. He got very angry about that. And he went and built and made his own whip. And he started driving out the people in, in the temple. And, and, and can you just get that vision in your mind? The soft, gentle, compassionate, loving Jesus. He got very angry at that point. And he started whipping them and whipping the stuff off the table. And he's like, you're making my father's house a den of robbers. And he got very angry about it. He had a no-nonsense attitude towards truth. In Luke chapter 9, he rebuked the evil spirits. He said, get out. He had no, no time of day for the evil spirits. He would just rebuke them. In, also in the story with Peter, when Peter said to Jesus, oh, Jesus, you're not going to die. I'm not going to allow that to happen. Jesus actually says to Peter, who's one of his closest friends, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> Imagine saying that to your like, best friend. <laughs> if your best friend is trying to throw you off your, your call, try to throw you off your anointing. 
and your mandate and your mission on life. Imagine saying to your best friend, get behind me, Satan. But Jesus said this to Peter. Jesus rebuked his disciples for the pride in their heart. You can read that in Luke chapter 9, verse 46. As I said, I'm just giving you a summarized version here. He rebuked the disciples again in the same chapter, Luke chapter 9, verse 51 to 56, for their racial bigotry. He rebuked them. He said, you guys need to get your act together. This is wrong. This is not the way that we behave. He rebuked the disciples and his followers again for their unbelief on multiple occasions. He said, where's your faith? What's wrong with you? Do you not believe? Why do you not believe? He rebuked them for that in Luke chapter 9, 39 to 41. Now, the word rebuke, whenever you hear the word rebuke, it's not the word that you might think. The rebuke here actually means to reprove and correct. He brought correction Every time he saw there was something out of place, he would bring correction. He wasn't afraid to speak the truth. And I love that about Jesus. He had an absolute no-nonsense attitude. And I think I like that character. You know, I want to say I want to adopt that character. I want that character to be louder in me. That when I see something that is not truth, when I see something that is going against the word of God, that I will have that same boldness to say this is not right. This is not the way it should be. And not to rebuke to make the person feel less but to bring correction and to bring reprove because that is the character of a teacher. And Jesus, of course, one of his characters is a teacher. So those are the five highlighted characteristics of Jesus. But I'm going to read you just a whole bunch more. You can just listen to this. Jesus was so full of peace. He was also a peacemaker. In other words, when he walked into a room, he didn't bring a storm. He brought the calm. Think about that one. This characteristic is in us. This characteristic is in you. When he walked into a room, he brought calm. He didn't bring the storm. That's what Jesus did. He was courageous. He was wise. He, well, not wise, he is. Let's say he is. He is kind. He's a good listener. He's obedient, full of faith, faithful, generous. He was a servant at heart, thankful, so hopeful. He was unafraid. He was sacrificial, spirit-filled. He was focused on his mission, etc., etc., etc. And all of these characteristics of Jesus is in us for the glory of God. That's what we have got within us, deposited within us. So when we read a scripture in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 to 16, and it's talking about you and I being the salt and light of the earth, that we bring flavor and we bring light. The reason we can do that is because we've got the character of Jesus in us. Isn't that remarkable? Isn't that really, really quite remarkable to realize that is who we are? And as I said just now, we don't always feel that way, right? <laughs> Sometimes we feel like, oh, I've missed, I've missed the whole Jesus character today. That's okay. You just repent, you ask the Lord to forgive you, and you start again, you move forward, and you keep on realizing you've got to rely on the Holy Spirit for everything because he's your helper. So that's the characteristics of Jesus. Now I want us to go into the second part, looking at Jesus. It's all about him. What is the position of Jesus now? And what is the role of Jesus now, we've done a great study on the pre-existence of Jesus before the earth, and we've had a look at Jesus on earth. But now, what is his role and what is his position? Let's go to the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews is towards the end of the New Testament. It's before the book of James. So if you're looking at James, you've gone a bit far. Just go back one. Hebrews chapter 1. Radio, I'm reading you from the Amplified Version. I'm reading to you from the Amplified Version. My English is a little poor today. My, my, my sinuses are a little bit shocked. So here we go. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3. Talking about Jesus. He is the sole expression of the glory of God the light being the art ring or radiance of the divine. And he is the perfect imprint and very image of God's nature, upholding and maintaining and guiding and propelling the universe by his mighty word of power. Isn't that just amazing how majestic Jesus is? When he had, by offering himself, accomplished our cleansing of sins and 
the, uh, the riddance of guilt, he sat down at the right hand of the divine majesty on high. What is the position of Jesus right this very moment? Jesus is sitting at the right hand of Father God. That's where Jesus is. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father. That's his position. Now, if you think about that, we can do like a whole intense study on that, but I want you just to, pick, just to think about that a little bit. If you're sitting at the right hand of someone, what do you generally have? You've got their ear. You've got their ear. Jesus is right there next to God the Father. Right there. That's his position at this very moment. Now, what is the role of Jesus? Let's go look at Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 17. Hebrews chapter 2. We're going to be spending most of the rest of today's study in the book of Hebrews. Okay. So what is the role of Jesus right now? We've just seen that his position is at the right hand of the Father. That's where Jesus is sitting right this minute. What is his role? Hebrews chapter 2, 17. So it is evident that it was essential that he be made like his brethren in every respect in order that he might become a merciful, sympathetic, and faithful high priest in the things related to God to make atonement and propitiation for the people's sin. So what is the role of Jesus right now? He's our high priest. What is the position? He's sitting right next, to Jesus, right next to God, on the right side of God. But his role is a high priest. Let's confirm Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 14. Inasmuch them as we have a great high priest who has already ascended and passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession of faith in him. Again, we get conf confirmation that the role of Jesus is our high priest. So he's positioned at the right hand of the Father, and his role is serving as a high priest for us. Many people say that Jesus has done everything he possibly can for us. Now he's in heaven. That's true to a point. Everything he's done on earth is a done deal, but his role has not ended. It's not like he's just now in heaven and has just forgotten about us. He has a role. We're going to look at that specifically now. What is the significance of being a high priest? What is the significance of that? In order for us to really understand the significance of it, we need to go back a little bit into the beginning of, beginning of when this all began. Now, right back in the book of Genesis, we get to start becoming familiar with the term high priest. One of them, for example, was the king and priest Melchizedek. Um, the story with him was Abraham in Genesis chapter 14. Abraham was facing a really volatile army, the army of Elam, and he, he needed help. So he went to the king and the priest Melchizedek, and he asked him, you know, please give us a blessing. And Melchizedek did give him a blessing, and they won the battle, they had the victory, and then what... Um, Abraham then did from that point on is he gave a tenth of all of his earnings to the king and to the priest as a thank offering. And that's where the whole principle of the tenth of your, of your income all was initiated all the way back then. But the first priest that God appointed was Aaron, A-A-R-O-N. He was the first high priest that God himself appointed. And Levi, who was also connected to Abraham, he became the servant of the tabernacle. So we had the Levites, and then we had the priests, and then you have the high priest. I'm not going to go into too much detail with all of that, but I'm just trying to set a bit of a foundation for you. So what was the role of the high priest? What was his function? What was his job? The main function of the high priest is that he would, once a year, he would enter the holy place once a year. He would enter the holy place that was uh, called the Day of Atonement. He would enter the holy place and he would take a blood offering, a sacrifice, and he would place it on the Ark of the Covenant as atonement for all the people's sins. To say, please God, accept this offering. Do not kill us for our sins. 
Because remember, before Jesus, there was no grace. So in those times, as soon as a person would sin, they would be immediately cut off from God, and many terrible things could happen to them. So the priest's job was to go atone for the people's sins once a year. What the priest also had to do, he was also the mediator, he was the intercessor, and he was the advocate to God on behalf of the people. Only one person had the role of being high priest. They had to be perfectly holy, set apart. They were separated from the people. They weren't allowed to, obviously they were always men. The men obviously were not allowed to be married. They weren't allowed to have sexual partners. They had to be pure in the full sense of the term, remain separate from everybody. And then once a year they could go and make a blood sacrifice to God and say to God, Please, God, we're asking you, forgive us of all of our sins. This is what the high priest would do. So now we read in the New Testament that Jesus is our high priest. How interesting is that? Now that you've got an understanding of what a high priest did. So now let's go read again Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15. We've read the scripture in one of the previous sessions. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to understand and sympathize and have a shared feeling with our weaknesses and infirmities and liability to the assaults of temptation. But we have a high priest, one who has been tempted in every respect as we are, yet without sinning. So remember I spoke to you about how the high priest had to be set apart from the people. He wasn't allowed to be tempted in any shape or form. This scripture is saying Jesus... He's not a high priest like that. He's the high priest. He understands us. The high priests in the, in the Old Testament times, they didn't understand people because they didn't mix with them. They had to stay apart from them. But St. Jesus, he's a high priest who understands. He understands what we go through. He understands our temptations, yet still without sin. Now we read one chapter on Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 6. And it says this. As he says also in another place, you are a priest appointed forever after the order with the rank of Melchizedek. So what this is saying that Jesus is forever going to be our high priest. Forever. So it's in, in the Old Testament times, they would appoint a new high priest seasonally. There'd always be a new one. Jesus, from the time he left the cross, will forever be our high priest. Now we go read Hebrews 7. I hope any of you that may have read these scriptures before about Jesus being a high priest, maybe you didn't have a grand understanding, and maybe now all the pennies are starting to drop a little bit. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 26 to 27. Here is the high priest, perfectly adapted to our needs, as was fitting, holy, blameless, unstained by sin, separated from sinners, and exalted higher than the heavens. Verse 27. He has no day-by-day -day necessity, as do each of these other high priests, to offer sacrifice first of all for his own personal sins, and then for those of the people. In other words, he says Jesus doesn't have to offer a daily sacrifice, because he met all the requirements once and for all when he brought himself as a sacrifice, which he offered up. So the scripture is saying that there's no necessity to do a yearly sacrifice or a daily sacrifice because Jesus did it once and for all. Once and for all, he sacrificed with his very own blood. In the Old Testament, they had to use the bloods of animals and etc. But in Jesus' case, he said, I use my own blood as a sacrifice and it's done once and for all. Now we go to Hebrews 9. See how easy I've made it for you? I'm just going one chapter on. Hey? So thank you, Tracy. Mm -hmm. Not so difficult. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11 to 12. But that appointed time came when Christ the Messiah appeared as a high priest of the better things that have come and are to come. Then through the greater and more perfect tab tabernacle, not made with human hands, that is, not not a part of this material creation. He went once for all into the holy of holies of heaven, not by virtue of the blood of goats and calves, by which to make reconciliation between God and man, but his own blood, having found and secured a complete redemption, an everlasting release for us. 
So the scripture's confirming he didn't have to use the blood of animals. He used his own blood. That's why Jesus' blood had to be shed on the cross. Because it was a sacrifice. He was our living sacrifice for the full atonement of our sins, once and for all. Isn't that just remarkable? Absolutely. Is it a done deal? Let's go read Hebrews chapter 10, one chapter on. Hmm, one chapter on. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14 to 18. For by a single offering, he has forever completed, completely cleansed, and perfected those who are consecrated and made holy forever. He doesn't have to die again. You don't have to die again through crucifixion, or you don't have to beat yourself up and whack yourself with a whip and do penance for 10 months to get over your sins. Jesus has forever done it. It's forever. Verse 15, and also the Holy Spirit adds his testimony to us in confirmation of this, for having said, this is the agreement that I will set up and conclude with them after those days, said the Lord, says the Lord. I will imprint my laws upon their hearts and I will inscribe them onto their minds. He then goes on to say, and their sins and their law breaking I will remember no more. Oh, thank you God for that. Verse 18, now where there is absolute remission, forgiveness, and cancellation of the penalty of these sins and law breaking, there is no longer any offering necessary made to atone for sins. That is now conclusive evidence that we no longer have to have any sacrifices brought before God for our forgiveness. It's a done deal. Done deal. Now I know there are still some cultures and there are still some beliefs, and I've even heard in some Christian variations, there are still people that feel that you've got to make sacrifices to God, your blood sacrifices. That is actually classified as a cult. Okay, if you're going to bring an animal and you're going to sacrifice that before God, it's classified as, an, as, as, as witchcraft. It's no longer necessary because what you're saying is that this animal needs to add to what Jesus did. The scriptures confirm what Jesus did was a done deal. It's done forever. There is no more blood that's needed. No more blood from an animal. No more blood needed from a man. Jesus did it all. He was our sacrifice, incomplete. Now I want us to really look specifically here at the role of Jesus. We're going back to Hebrews 7. Same book, Hebrews 7 and verse 23. Again, the former successive line of priests was made up of many because they were each prevented by death from continuing. But he, who is Jesus, holds his priesthood unchangeably because he lives forever. Verse 25. Therefore, he is able to save to the uttermost completely, perfectly, finally, and for all time and eternity. Those who come to God through him since he is always living to make petition to God and intercede with him and intervene for them. This is the role of Jesus right now. As our high priest, do you realize that we have a personal intercessor? We have a personal intercessor, Jesus, who's sitting at the right hand of the Father, right this very minute and Jesus is looking at his father as his father leans over I just get this picture of, of God sitting on his throne Jesus sitting on his on, on the right side of him I can just get this image of God slightly leaning over while Jesus comes and whispers in his ear and while he's speaking into the ear of God he's interceding for us He's inter intervening for us. So when God is looking upon us and seeing what we are doing and all the maracas that we're getting up to, is that a word, maracas? And all the nonsense and all the sin and all the evil and, the, and the, talking now about the children of God, those who've accepted Jesus already. And then Jesus leans over to his father and he says, remember, Dad, I've atoned for their sins. Remember. Oh, Lord, can you see, Tracy, she really needs our help right now. 
He's interceding for us. He's intervening for us. That's the role of Jesus right now. And I get pretty excited when I think about that because I'm like, have you ever, ever felt no one's praying for me? Have you ever felt that way? I'm going through so much. Nobody cares. Nobody's praying. Nobody even knows the struggles I'm experiencing right now. Have you ever felt that way? Well, you don't ever have to feel that way ever again because you have your personal intercessor sitting next to God the Father. And his name is Jesus. And he is our high priest. And he's sitting there right by God the Father. And he's saying, Dad, we need to help out here. Let's listen to their prayers. God, for, you know, you remember my blood has covered that. I know that Tracy's like mess, missing the mark right now. But remember, my blood has atoned. She's atoned. Remember, even though she said those things, my blood has atoned her. She's forgiven. Remember that, God. That's the role of Jesus right now, interceding and intervening for us. And now we come to the conclusion of the study. There's a scripture in Hebrews 4 verse 16. And it says in Hebrews 4 verse 16, maybe we should just go and read it. Why not? We've read so much scripture. Let's just read it. Hebrews 4 16. And it says, let us then, remember the scripture just before this was talking about Jesus being the high priest who understands us. Verse 16, let us then fearlessly and confidently and boldly draw near to the throne of grace, the throne of God's unmerited favor to us sinners, that we may receive mercy for our failures and find grace to help in good time for every need, appropriate help and well-timed help coming just when we need it. And I really felt that I wanted to conclude this whole study with this portion of scripture because what this really shows us is because of what Jesus did and because of who Jesus is and because of where Jesus is now sitting, you and I have direct access to the throne of God. Direct access. Wow. Wow. That's pretty remarkable. The word when it says you must come boldly before God, the Greek word for that is parousia, P-A-R-R-E-S-I-A, -R -R -E parousia. What this Greek word means is that you can come forthrightly and you can come boldly and you can come frankly. You can come with frankness. You know that sometimes you want to tell someone a story or you want to, you want to maybe there's something on your heart that's upset you about something? And you feel like you've got to tiptoe around the story. You know what I'm saying? You've got to like tiptoe and kind of like soften it down. What the scripture is saying is you don't have to do that with God. Because of Jesus and because he's our high priest, we can have direct access to the throne and we can be forthright with God. We can be frank with God. We can come with boldness before, before God the Father. We can come to him and we can say, God, I need your help right now. You're allowed to do that. You're allowed to ask him straight up for it. You can go straight to the throne room. You don't have to go through any more sacrifices. You don't have to pray for an hour before you're holy enough to speak to him. You can speak to him right now, right this very second. You can be sitting on the toilet and you can speak to him. You can be in the shower and you can speak to him. You can be putting your head on the pillow just before you go to sleep there's something troubling in your heart you can have direct access to the throne room of God that's what the scripture is saying you can come boldly directly to God through Jesus because of where Jesus is sitting and that word time in the scripture is the Greek word eukairos which basically means a suitable time what that's basically saying is any time is good <laughs> You're like, well, what time am I allowed to go speak to God? Any time, because he lives outside of it. Any time. You can go to him any time. Morning, evening, lunchtime, breakfast time, when you're feeling great, when you're not feeling great, when you're sick, when you're healthy, when, you're full of, when you feel like you've committed the greatest sin or when you feel like you are living your most holy life. There is, it's always the perfect time to go directly into the throne room of God. Always. And we can do that because Jesus broke the barrier. 
Jesus broke the barrier for us. He tore the veil. The veil was torn, separating us from God. And because of Jesus, we have been able to come boldly, directly to the Father. Wow. We can all say praise the Lord and thank you, God, for that. Praise the Lord for that. So this study, it's all about Jesus. It's come, we've come now to the conclusion of it. It's all about Jesus. What we've done is we've had a look at the pre-existence of Jesus before earth, before time. We've confirmed that Jesus is God the Son before the earth was even created. He was with God and the Holy Spirit in the beginning, before the beginning. And then we had a look at Jesus' time on earth, how he did the great exchange with us, how he humbled himself as a slave, as a servant, how he became exactly like man so that we can become in relationship with God. And then we briefly looked at when Jesus went to the cross, the great exchange took place on the cross, and then when he willingly gave up his life. And because of that, then God said, I'm giving him the name that is above all, every, all names, and that every knee and every tongue will confess, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. We've looked at that. And then in this final session, we can see the position of Jesus right now is at the right hand of the Father. And his role right now is interceding for you and I. He's intervening on our behalf. He's our personal prayer team. We have the personal prayer team of Jesus right there with the ear of the Father. And that's the role of Jesus. And then to come will be when Jesus comes riding. Well, first he's to come right, take us as, as his children, or as, as, as children of God, to come and take us up to heaven. And then there will come a time when he will come riding back on his white horse with the army of heaven. And there will be a time then when he will come and destroy all the evil and destroy the enemy completely, annihilate him and forever throw him into the pit of hell. That time is still coming. So we have a glorious redeemer, savior, loving, forgiving, compassionate, mighty, victorious intercessor in our Jesus. And here is our Jesus. He's our Jesus, and he's my Jesus. That is who he is. So when we think of Jesus in this time to come, which is Christmas time, whether you celebrate it or not, everyone always talks about Jesus being in the manger. Yes, let's, let's think about that for a minute. But don't forget where he came from. And don't forget where he is now. And don't forget who he is going to be for us in the future coming in that white horse. He's not just the baby in the manger. Remember the big picture of who Jesus is. It's all about Jesus. I trust that the study has been a great blessing to you. We have gone through a lot in six sessions. Be once, against, be once against encouraged. Be once again encouraged. Go listen to the sessions again and really let this revelation settle deep within your spirit. Let it settle deep within your spirit because everything that we are doing, it's all about him. It's all about Jesus, everything. Everything's about him. So you need to have an understanding of who he is in order to understand the meaning and the purpose even of your very own life. Right? Let the study become your personal revelation. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for bringing this revelation to us and for just opening up your word to us, giving us the ability to really have a greater understanding of who Jesus is. Oh, Jesus, we thank you that you are our high priest. And that at this very moment, you are sitting next to, the, next to the Father, at the right hand of the Father, and you are interceding for every single one of us. Jesus, you know what's going on in every one of our hearts through the Holy Spirit. You are aware of that. And so just even in this moment in time, Holy Spirit, we ask you to give, download all of that information to Jesus. And Jesus, we ask you boldly to intervene for us, to intercede for us. 
Father God, we thank you we can come boldly into your throne room. We can be bold before you, and we can be frank before you, and we can be forthright before you. Because of what your son Jesus did for us, we have the privilege of being right now in your throne room in the Spirit. I ask you, Holy Spirit, to make us all acutely aware, to become very intently aware of the fact that even though we might be sitting here in our physical bodies, that our spirit is now communicating directly with Father God. So hear the hearts of every person, Lord, I pray. Hear the cries. Hear the petitions. Hear the thankfulness. Hear the gratitude in all of our hearts. And we just want to end this moment by saying thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you for everything that you have done for us mere humans, <laughs> that we can come into your throne and we can be called your children. With so much gratitude in our heart, we say thank you. Thank you for the study, Holy Spirit. Let it really settle in every one of our spirits and let it grow and continue to teach us, I pray. Continue to show us and continue to reveal more of Jesus to us and help us to be transformed into his likeness as your word says we should be. Help us to start looking more and more like him. We can only do it with your help, Holy Spirit. And we thank you for that. Bless the study in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Tracy. Amen, ladies. Isn't that a beautiful study? Isn't that beautiful? I was very aware of the presence of God right there in that moment, as I trust you were as well. And um, may the study be a continuous blessing to all of you, in particularly the season that we are going into now. Let it be a continuous blessing to you and in the months and the years to come, that we always have a very, very clear understanding of who Jesus is. Amen. Thank you for being part of the study. Till the next study starts, I will see you then. God bless and goodbye.